Hello, thank you for joining us today. My name is Dr. Demetria Rujo Shabazz, and I'm here with um, the other Dr. Shabazz. Introduce yourself. Yes, I am a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a producer here at Amherst Media of Difficult Dialogues and other programs. I'm the proud president of the board of directors at Amherst Media and we welcome you today for our celebration of Juneteenth. June 19th, 2020, we celebrate today emancipation of all those who were enslaved here within the U.S. June 19th first began after General Granger came to Galveston, Texas, my hometown, in 1865 to announce the emancipation of enslaved people. Since then, it has been celebrated in the state of Texas, but it has grown amongst African Americans uh, to go worldwide. You see celebrations in Europe, in Japan, and of course all over the nation. I want to talk about briefly uh, before our progr program begins about what African American history means to me and why it's important in a time now to celebrate and recognize the contributions of African Americans and people of color to the United States. We have been experiencing many um, moments that have challenged us as a nation, as a people, both locally and around the world, particularly the deaths of George Floyd, Amon Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, to name a few. This is not new for the African American community. And one of the ways in which we have been able, uh, since slavery, to carry ourselves through to give renewed hope is the recognition and celebration of Juneteenth. In a way, it is our Emancipation Day. And so we're inviting folks within this community to once again recognize Juneteenth and celebrate this uh, along with us. This year we are recognizing two community members who for 10 years have been celebrating Juneteenth with us, Edward and Vera Cage. These two wonderful community members uh, started 10 years ago with a family recreation day and since then we joined with them each Juneteenth to uh, continue this wonderful tradition. My husband and I are both from Texas so it's very meaningful to us and now I'll let him um, explain uh, what we plan to do this Juneteenth. Thank you. Thank you. And it's, um, you know, as both being from Texas, we always have to apologize for that and uh, express, a, you know, our awareness that Texans are known for being very boastful, uh, the tall Texan tales and, and so forth. And uh, while we were both born there, we know a lot of Texas's history is, uh, is kind of puffed up and problematic. But, um, but that Juneteenth part of it uh, became meaningful uh, for us uh, for really in the 1970s. And it was part of the uh, flowering, if you will, the furious flowering of the black arts movement and the black power movement of the 70s kind of flowering in Texas that it took a, an historical existing celebration and begin to kind of revitalize it, breathe a, a new breath of cultural and uh, political and intellectual energy into it that really caught on. It caught on, it had always caught on at the grassroots, but now it took on even more meaning because it was connecting itself to the political struggles, the day-to-day -day resistance 
of black people to their oppression, to their, to their repression. And so when it came up like that in the 70s, I was very much moved by it. I was in Austin, Texas, and um, the, um, the kind of pivotal event is that it tied in again with police brutality. There was a case, uh, there was a, a huge annual celebration of Juneteenth in East Texas, uh, in Mahaya. Uh, in an area particularly out there, thousands of people gathered. This had gathered historically in deep East Texas. Um, but this particular part of Mejia, uh, this big parkland with water running, had a place called Comanche Crossing. And it was at that Comanche Crossing, that, that, that waterway, that little lake, that three police officers took three young African-American men into custody uh, disorderly conduct, maybe uh, thought they had some weed on them or marijuana on them, but they were they took them into custody and wanted to ferry them across the Comanche crossing in a three person boat. Three officers take three young black men and still has them handcuffed on in the in the little craft. And as they get out there going to the other side, it capsizes the three black men all drown. They couldn't breathe. Gone. Two of the officers white, one of the officers black, um, myself and some other comrades, we would go to the courthouse there to see what was going to happen, what kind of justice. All three got off. Not even a violation of the Boating Safety Act. They couldn't even get them on that. So for me, it, it, it Juneteenth, has been uh, connected to the struggle of our people in this country against anti-blackness, anti-black laws, anti-black policies, and anti-black policing. It's been inextricably tied. So this current moment here in, in Amherst, yes, it's a 10th anniversary and we're going virtual because the pandemic is no joke. We don't want to bring folks together in, in, in any kind of big crowds or big gathering like we've been doing the previous years here in Amherst, uh, respecting that we're still not out of this health crisis, this pandemic. But we're coming to you through Amherst Media, live with a wonderful program that will get started very shortly um, with uh, Kirsten Mullen and Sandy Darity, and we'll talk more about that. But I just really want to highlight that the question you raise, D, of uh, why does history matter? How does history matter? That is what the reflective moment of Juneteenth is all about. It's about saying our lives matter. Let's recreate. Let's reflect. Let's enjoy ourselves. And, and let's get free. Let's do it. And so we, we offer uh, these activities today. We embrace the continuation of this partnership uh, with a lot of folks that, that started with Ed and Vera Cage 10 years ago. Um, they were residents of South Point and they wanted to do something in the apartments. It grew in different ways, a little bigger than that. They ended up doing it in Groff Park. When I saw some little notice there was going to be a Juneteenth in Groff Park, I said, whoa, you know, I was surprised. Um, it has moved out in different states, but in different places. But in 2010, that it, somebody was doing an Amherst, I'm like, well, I got to go check that out. And that's where I met them. They were at that very time moving into in the throes of a campaign to uh, uh, free uh, Charles Wilhite, who was under a life uh, sentence for a murder he didn't commit. Uh, that later resulted in a, um, a second trial. They overturned the conviction and he won a multi-million dollar payout from the city of Springfield for his wrongful incarceration. So I began to know them further from Juneteenth, further into the Free Charles Will High Justice for Charles campaign, and of course into other work uh, throughout the last 10 years. But we've always joined forces to, to keep this tradition of Juneteenth going, to keep this moment going for reflection, for coming together. And for me, the partnership with Amherst Media on this is very vital, very important, because Amherst Media is the democratic 
pulse of this community. It is it opens the airwaves. You all open the channels for communication of information, of joy, of just what people are doing to have fun in Amherst, you know, what people are doing uh, governmentally, educationally, um, and in all ways, civic ways. It's right here at Amherst Media. And that's why I, I've always seen it as, as the kind of the, the democratic heart of uh, of this community and so i'm i'm very happy to uh, uh to have the support to uh, engage in this kind of virtual um celebration of juneteenth and to uh particularly do it in partnership with amherst media thank you good afternoon we are here to celebrate Juneteenth. Our proclamation is being read by nine different counselors from the Amherst Town Council. And we will begin with the first statement. Whereas our country is made up of people from every nation on earth who are declared equal, not only in freedom, but also in justice, both of which are essential for a healthy home, human civilization and Whereas our nation was conceived on July 4th, 1776 with the Declaration of Independence, the classic statement being, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and... Whereas at 2 p.m. on New Year's Day, January 1st, 1863, using his war powers as president, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, providing that all persons held as slaves with any, within any state or designated part of the state shall be then, thenceforward and forever free. And whereas the Emancipation Proclamation made the permanent abolition of slavery a Union war aim and provided the legal framework for the emancipation of nearly all four million slaves as the Union armies advanced and... Whereas, hearing of the proclamation, many slaves escaped to Union lines as the Army units moved south and... Whereas on June 19, 1865, almost two and a half years later, Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas and announced the end of both the Civil War and slavery with this announcement. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves and the connection there heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The freedmen are advised to remain at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts. They will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. And Whereas Texans began the celebration in 1866 with community events such as parades, cookouts, prayer gatherings, musical performances, and historic cultural readings. Some communities purchased land for Juneteenth celebrations, such as Emancipation Park in Houston, Texas. And as freed families created this to other parts of the United States, they carried the Juneteenth celebration with them and whereas Al Edwards, a freshman state representative, put forward the bill HB 1016 in 1979, making Texas the first state to grant this emancipation celebration. And whereas on January 1st, 1980, Juneteenth became an official Texas state holiday. And whereas since then, 45 other states in the District of Columbia have also declared it an official holiday and 
Whereas in Amherst, residents began organizing community-wide Juneteenth celebrations as early as 2011. Now, therefore, we, the Amherst Town Council, do hereby proclaim June 19th, 2020 as Juneteenth in Amherst to be celebrated at 4 p.m. by vigorous ringing of the bells throughout the community, if practical. Voted this 27th day of April, 2020. Oh 
keep us forever in the past. We pray, lest our feet stray from the places our God bear we can't be. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget Shadow beneath thy head, may we forever stand true to our God, true to our name. The African American community of Amherst has a long history, dating back well before the town was incorporated in 1759. We begin this slideshow with an example of the early town records that document this history. The remainder features images of community members, organizations, and churches, accompanied by music from the Blue Ribbon Syncopators featuring Amherst resident Gil Roberts. To document Amherst's African-American community, you must search through a variety of records and try to piece together a history because of how fully Black Indigenous people of color have been and continue to be marginalized by our society. It is important to recognize that the first African Americans in Amherst were slaves. Records such as this 1759 tax valuation list help bring this history to light. In this list, property categories list slaves alongside horses, cows, real estate, and other property in a column titled Negro Faculty. Scrolling through the names, you might come across Alicia Ingram. He owned two horses, three cows, and one slave. Who that person was remains unknown. There are countless other members of the African American community of Amherst about whom we know little or nothing. However, the remainder of this slideshow celebrates some of the many community members we do know of.
Juneteenth 2020 has as its theme this year, reparations. It's been in the news a lot. It's uh, their bills, major bills in Congress, in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. Uh, there are efforts going on in various states, uh, going on in local municipalities. It's become an important way to talk about and to take action for justice in this country. And in that spirit, joining forces with Bridge for Unity and intergroup, interracial, intergroup dialogue process that's going into its second year, we particularly uh, decided to uh, do a discussion of a, an important book that's out. And what follows is a live conversation with Dr. William Darity Jr. and Kirsten Mullen, the authors of From Here to Equality, Black Reparations in the 21st Century. This discussion is very timely for Amherst uh, uh, in that Sandy, uh, William Darity, owned to many of us as Sandy, uh, is from Amherst, graduated from Amherst Regional High School. Uh, his family were a vital part of this community. His father came here as a faculty member in uh, the 1960s, went on to found the School of Public Health at UMass in the 1970s. And uh, we are very excited to uh, uh, join forces with this uh, native son of Amherst in the upcoming discussion. Happy Juneteenth, happy Juneteenth, happy Juneteenth 2020. And welcome to this live webinar. We are a lot of forces coming together to engage in this discussion, this very important discussion of a very important new book. My name is Jokar Shabazz. I'm president of the National Council of Black Studies. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts in the W.B. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies. And I'm proud to partner with Bridge for Unity, an anti-racist dialogue group with the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, as well as with Amherst Media through whom we are broadcasting this locally in, um, in Western Massachusetts on Channel 12, but also on Facebook. And so if you are looking uh, through Facebook, feel free to use the chat function to um, chime in, let us know you're here. But, um, what we really wanted to do is stimulate interest in this important new book from here to equality, reparations for Black Americans in the 21st century, authored by William Darity Jr. and Kirsten. The book is uh, published by the University of North Carolina Press. You can get a sneak preview of the first part of the book online at the at UNC Press. Um, the book has uh, three parts, but you can read the whole first part right here, and um, that'll get you started before yours comes in the mail or uh, on Kindle or however you download it, and you can then read the entire book. It's an important read, and um, we want to, at this time, um, bring, uh, introduce to you the authors, but also uh, to the fact that how this all came about. Uh, Bridge for Unity uh, launched 
a initiative on reparations uh, to, toward the earlier part of this year, we met in a retreat, decided on some action areas. And uh, as part of that reparations initiative, several of us got together and uh, formed a reading group to uh, read this book. And, um, uh, and then we had our, our, uh, our questions about it and we discussed it. And we really hope that to stimulate many of you to do the same thing in this uh, webinar today. And so, um, uh, but with no further ado, um, I would like to get right into things with our authors. Um, I've been knowing um, both uh, William Darity and Kirsten Mullen uh, back to the late 1970s. So uh, it's a good number of years. Uh, we were all uh, found ourselves in Texas, uh, the beloved state that gives us Juneteenth uh, back during that time. Sandy uh, came to the faculty uh, in 1978 uh, in the economics department, uh, but he's gone on from there to uh, these days uh, is a professor of economics, public policy, and Africana studies at Duke University. Um, and the, um, uh, and Kirsten, who uh, we were, um, both students at the uh, University of Texas uh, back there in the 70s. She has gone on to become an important folklorist as well as museum consultant uh, and of course an author, uh, co-authoring this book uh, as well as other works that she has, uh, has produced over the years. They are uh, parents of, uh, of two uh, great young men and uh, they uh, also have ties to the area. Uh, Sandy's uh, father was the uh, was a faculty member here, came here to the University of Massachusetts in the 1960s. Um, he went on in the early 70s to found our School of Public Health. Um, and uh, when I arrived here in 2007, he was uh, here and uh, going strong. So I did have a chance to, uh, to, uh, to meet William Darity Sr. as well and get to know him. Um, Sandy finished at Amherst Regional High School. Um, so we hope if some of you here locally are watching and remember your classmate, you can uh, uh, give them a shout if you wish uh, online on the uh, Facebook stream. But um, with that said, I'd like to uh, ask, um, I think of them as uh, Sandy and Kirsten, but, uh, but I'd like to ask our authors to talk about how this book came about why you got involved in the writing of it. And uh, uh, because I know it's been an abiding issue uh, among scholars for a long time. I had the, uh, the pleasure to come to UNC Chapel Hill some years back when Sandy had a major um, uh, international uh, meeting of the minds on, of scholars on the issue. But, but why this book, why now? Well, um... Maybe I should try to start from the point at which I developed my own personal commitment to the reparations project. Um, about 30 years ago, uh, during 1989 to be exact, uh, a, an economist who is based at the University of Pennsylvania named Richard Franklin America mm -hmm. asked me to provide the introduction for a volume of essays that he was publishing that uh, were the attempt by a variety of economists to estimate what the size of a bill should be for black reparations in the United States. And so um, at that point, I was what you might call a reparation skeptic. Uh, I told Richard that uh, I, I thought that as a matter of principle, reparations were, uh, were entirely justified but uh, as a matter of practical execution, as a matter of getting it to be something that would be politically viable, that it was wholly unrealistic, and uh, why were we investing our time in doing something that could never really happen? And Richard told me to please go ahead and read the essays, write whatever I desired. If I wanted to say something completely negative about all of the essays or the reparations project itself, he, he was giving me carte blanche to do that. So 
so I did. I, I proceeded to read these essays. And the more that I read, the more that I became convinced that the strength of the case for reparations was so intense and so strong that I would need to make a commitment to trying to pursue having reparations become a reality, even if the odds were extremely long. And I came to recognize that if, if it was 1819 in the United States of America, people might have the assumption that slavery would never come to an end. But that would not mean that you would not fight to bring it to an end. And so similarly, in 1990, when I was looking forward, there were very dim prospects for reparations be becoming something that was even part of, this, of the serious national conversation. Uh, but I also recognized that since it was the right thing to do, then it was something I was going to pursue. Um, I think that that resulted in my doing a series of papers and public lectures about reparations. I think what was a bit unique about the work that I was trying to do uh, was I was trying to figure out how you might actually do this. What would be the structure of a reparations program? Uh, and I think that that's something that had been missing from the conversation to a large degree. Uh, so uh, I think it was about eight years ago, I gave a lecture at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And one of the editors from the UNC Press was in the room and she came up to me afterward and said, have you ever thought about doing a book? And uh, I said, well, no, I hadn't. And she said, you should. And so that began a series of conversations with the press about the possibility of creating a book. And I also realized that I had a, a, a joint author who shared the same home with me, uh, if, if I could persuade her to be a joint author, uh, because of her a, a passion for history, which I think is, was critical to the pro project, as well as her understanding of folklore. So I think Kirsten and I have a saying that all black American folklore is true. Uh, <laughs> as, uh, uh, but uh, I asked Kirsten if she would, if she would collaborate with me on the project. And, you know, I leave it to her to tell you the rest of the story. <laughs> so you know, both from families uh, that were active, uh, actively engaged in the civil rights movement, um, both of us were um, brought to marches. Uh, I can remember in particular uh, in Fort Worth, Texas, where I grew up, um, that, uh, you know, after an Episcopal priest was murdered in Haynesville, Alabama, um, there was a march in Fort Worth. And um, my mother, uh, Avis Ann Mullen, was, I believe, the only teacher, the only black teacher who marched. And um, it was quite extraordinary. Um, you know, we had never, um, it, you know, I had never been involved in anything on that scale uh, before, and certainly never, um, you know, uh, with, with such large numbers of white people, right? this was during the segregated South. Uh, so it was a very a head spinning kind of moment, uh, but it was one that would happen on several occasions after that. Um, then uh, fast forward to um, our older son, uh, Aiden's birth and uh, taking him to visit, to, you know, well, introducing him actually to his paternal grandparents. And uh, this was in uh, Lauderdale County, Alabama. And having my grandfather, Otis Mullen, you know, hold the baby, you know, above his head, you know, uh, this was in the, the era of Alex Haley's Roots, uh, the novel, and then the very successful, um, much watched uh, television series. And he pronounced, uh, you know, he said, you know, this is, this is the fifth generation. And uh, I remember at the time, not really knowing exactly what he meant. Um, but after we began the research for um, From Here to Equality, I learned that that north uh, western uh, corner of Alabama um, was a hot spot for lynchings. Um, you look at Lauderdale and the three counties that adjoin it, something like 18 lynchings occurred between 1877 and 1943. And so it was really significant for my grandfather that we, our line, our lineage, had made it, you know, five generations from 
this period of enslavement. Um, you know, they were, uh, this is a part of my family that still lived in calling distance from the white people who had enslaved us, right? And so it was very much on his mind when he was meeting his first uh, great grandchild. Um, you know, I grew up, you know, uh, in a family in a community that celebrated Juneteenth. Uh, I grew up with people who talked about the 40 acres, uh, the unfulfilled promise uh, to the formerly enslaved. And that is the basis that we use for determining who the recipients of reparations should be, um, you know, Black American descendants of U.S. slavery. And we use that 40 acres, um, you know, that is the, 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 um, uh, the grub stake, that's the, uh, the, the reserve, the nest egg that Black people didn't get, right? Um, and this was at the same time that white Americans uh, through the Homestead Acts, received not 40 acre land grants, but 160 acre land grants. Maybe we can get into that a little bit later, but, uh, but these are some of the reasons that, um, you know, I was interested uh, in, in, in working on this project as well. Great. Uh, Dee, if you'll cue up the, the cover to the book, um, the, you use uh, on the cover a very powerful image mm -hmm. um, of the many, many lives that have been lost uh, to racial violence, to the racial violence that, that um, uh, marks this country. Um, but then as you go on, the, um, uh, you have a wonderful dedication uh, that starts out to our sons, Aiden and William, members of the fifth generation born since slavery was outlawed. And you go on from there to mention many different family names. Um, I noticed in one of them was uh, Talia Farrow. And of course, that was uh, a name of um, that Booker T. Washington's father was a Talia Farrow. He could never use it because mm -hmm. of, for obvious reasons, uh, Talia Farrow was a white man and did not uh, uh, represent himself as the father of uh, having been the father of Booker, Booker T. Washington. But also, it uh, was also the um, family name of Shokwe Lumumba. So I didn't know if you all had done any um, any kinds of uh, genealogy to see if there was any ties to either Booker T. Washington or or Shokwe Lumumba through that Talia Farrow connection. So my sister, Harriet Mullen, who's an academic uh, at UCLA, uh, assisted us greatly with that, that list and has done a lot of genealogical research. I don't know that she has made the connection to Lumumba, but it is also part of our family lore, uh, passed down from my great grandmother, uh, Hattie Tolliver, or Talia Farrow, uh, that all of the Talia Farrows are related. Wow. And um, you know, she, she, she would say, you know, uh, you know, black or white, these are people who are blood kin. Um, but I would, you know, definitely, uh, you know, encourage her to do some more research so we can be a little more specific. Um, I mean, we can talk a bit about, you know, Booker T. Washington's legacy. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, controversial, uh, to say the least, but, um, but quite possibly, quite possibly a relative. Well, where the book starts out in part, part one of, the, of six parts uh, is with the political history of America's Black reparations movement. And one of the um, instances of, uh, of that that you cite toward the end uh, of that uh, section is the uh, National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. And we have uh, with us um, a, a long uh, standing uh, part of, of INCOBRA. Um, I myself, of course, through my work with uh, Shokwe Lumumba going back to the uh, late 1970s, early, early 1980s. I as well um, have been uh, involved with INCOBRA from the very beginning. But uh, Kathleen Anderson, who um, uh, is here in, in Amherst, uh, preceded me on the school, school committee, the local Amherst school committee, uh, before I was on it for three years. I invite Kathleen now to come in and to uh, provide an introduction for, uh, for Minister Ari, who will then pose a question uh, relative to the, that piece on the political history. Yes, thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Um, so I want to introduce uh, Minister Ari Moretazan, 
He is an ordained minister and community economic development practitioner. He's also a reparationist. Uh, Minister Amaretazan is the Northeast Regional Representative of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, known by the acronym INCOBRA. He's a minister of the Philadelphia chapter of INCOBRA. And in 2011 to 2012, he served as the ma National Male Co-Chair of INCOBRA. In the late uh, 80s, uh, he was the National Security Co-Chair for the National Black Independent Political Party. He is also one of the leading thoughts, uh, thought leaders on reparations for descendants of Africans enslaved in the United States. Uh, Minister Ari. Thanks so much, uh, Kathleen. And for, uh, for those who may or may not know, Kathleen is the uh, female co-chair of the New England chapter of uh, INCOBRA. So I just want everybody to put that on the record. Um, the question I have to the authors is that, uh, I, I, I didn't read the book, let me see that. I read your summary that was on uh, Amazon. So the book is on the way. And one of the things that I wanted to, I couldn't tell whether or not you dealt with the question. You dealt with a lot of numbers. But you didn't deal with the real, I didn't see where you dealt with the peoplehood of those who was affected by, directly affected, uh, monstrously affected by the, uh, the system of chattel slavery. So how do you tie that into the peoplehood, those numbers into the peoplehood of those who was the, who was very specific people who was enslaved in the United States? So, uh I hope you'll have the opportunity to read the book because I think the book is, is, is a combination of my impulses as an economist to try to jump to the numbers, as well as Kirsten's impulses as a folklorist to tell stories about people's lives. And so I think we do do that, and I, I hope we do it successfully. Uh, there's one particular section of the, of the book in which uh, we talk about the fact that people claim that slavery is something that happened so very, very long ago. And we have a number of family stories that we relate that indicate that, in fact, uh, from the standpoint of intergenerational connections, slavery didn't really happen all that long ago. And in fact, one of the stories is about the, uh, the woman who was the first faculty, black faculty member at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Hortense McClinton, and uh, she is actually still living. Uh, she's what, 101 years of age now? Her father, her father was born into slavery. And so uh, that's one of the stories that we relate. And one of the interesting things about that story is that they originally lived in Texas, but because her father had some uh, difficulties, shall we say, uh, with some white folks over his business, uh, practices, uh, and it, there wasn't anything uh, illegal about his business practices. He was just too darn successful. And so uh, the family had to relocate to Boley, Oklahoma, where they were in one of the many black towns of Oklahoma. Uh, so that's just one story that we tell uh, throughout the, the, uh, the section of the book on the period of reconstruction, on the period of uh, the run up to the end of the Civil War where there were a variety of experiments with black, uh, with black communities and blacks farming land. We tell a number of stories about the specific stories about the families that were, uh, were, were, in, in, were engaged in, in those situations. Uh, but I'll also add that in chapter one of the book, we talk at length about the history of the reparations movement in the United States. And we invest a substantial amount of time in talking about the individuals and the organizations that have promoted the reparations effort. And clearly, of course, we include in COBRA. Yeah. May I do a quick follow up? Just a quick sure. follow up. Um, the, I thank you so much for writing a book. Thanks so much for your explaining the context of peoplehood because uh, one of the major issues around this reparation dynamic now is de identifying the people who was directly affected. And we say there's, they, they are descendants of African enslaved in the United States. I know there's an ADOS group, uh, American descendants of, of, of slavery, that doesn't suggest uh, any type of real history 
in terms of the African people of, of our peoplehood uh, who see that monstrous destruction. So uh, in that sense, um, is there an identification of that specific group? It would be very helpful if we able to come to agreement on who are or who, yeah, who are the descendants of African slaves in the United States? There's a big uh, um, historical marker that says the first Africans arrived in, well, not arrived, but the slaves in the uh, state of Virginia, in Jamestown, in 1619, right? And so that's why we say the facts and circumstances fit us right there as descendants of African slaves in the United States. And I'm thinking that uh, we sh should be able to overcome that notion of standing or the legal principle of standing as we uh, present that uh, identification or that identifier. So um, I, I don't know, Kirsten will probably have something to add here, but um, in the work that we're doing, we identify the culpable party that must pay the bill as the United States government. Yes, sir. And so the United States government didn't exist before 1776. And so in terms of the analysis that we pursue in our book, we set up a study of the atrocities that have taken place from 1776 to the present. Uh, we think it's problematic to talk about the period before that because then you're talking about having to assess a bill to the Dutch, to the UK, to the French, uh, to all of the countries that were part of the colonial process in the United States. And so given that, we focus on the folks who are descendants of the persons who were enslaved during the period of the existence of the United States. And further, we place a particular emphasis on the folks who are the descendants of the individuals when emancipated from slavery did not receive the promised 40 acres. So that's the cornerstone of much of our discussion in the book is the failure to provide the ancestors of today's living descendants of US slavery with the 40 acres. Yes, sir. You know, I'm here. I'm a descendant of African slaves in the United States, right? And so I didn't want you to just tag me as uh, not uh, dealing with people, uh, dealing with the issue from 1619 forward not, and not dealing with us today, you know? Uh, so I just want to say that we are dealing with the people who, we have identified the people who, are, who were enslaved then and are enslaved now. And they are, by the facts and circumstances, descendants of African enslaved in the United States. And I just want to make sure that I'm with you on the fact of current day uh, people and the issues. So to, to, the extent that, uh, to the extent that Black people have African ancestry and the, 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 the condition that we try to identify for eligibility is that you must be a Black American descendant of somebody who was enslaved in the United States, right. then we are capturing African ancestry as far, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Sure. Great job. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. I want to. We're, we're certainly not suggesting that uh, anybody who's living as white who might happen to have had an ancestor who was enslaved in the United States should be eligible for reparations. Absolutely not. I mean, part of the criteria that we would like to see established is that uh, recipients would have had to self identify uh, as Black, African American, or Negro at least 12 years before the creation of uh, a reparations committee. Or commission uh, or the enactment of a reparations program. I have I a think question. We're in agreement. I think we're in agreement. Yeah. Let me, uh, I wanted to pick up on that though, Kathleen, to say that uh, the, in the section on the political history, um, ADOS is mentioned uh, along with other, other groups and um, it really does establish a, a kind of continuity of, uh, of struggle when you take it all the way back to um, right after emancipation, to the work of Callie House, uh, to uh, Queen Mother Moore, to uh, James Foreman, uh, many different campaigns, but we'll, we'll talk more about other yeah. instances. And, and in, between, uh, in between Callie House and Queen Mother Moore, we have to pay attention to the Garvey movement Yep. And uh, and the fact that the Garvey movement were uh, was involved in advocacy for reparations as well, uh, and then we also talk about Malcolm X. We talk about uh, the Republic of New Africa. So uh, I, I mean, 
there are people we leave out. I mean, right. we, we missed Reparations Ray somehow, right. and we knew about him, but we don't actually mention him in the book. But we tried to be as careful about mentioning everybody who has been really committed to this struggle for reparations. I mean, we're very aware that, you know, uh, Black people, enslaved Black people, um, were the first abolitionists. Yeah. That's know, right. They were, uh, you know, continuously making efforts to liberate themselves, yeah. right? And then also to, uh, to receive payment, you know, to demand payment for their labors. So I think there's never been a moment when, you know, these folks, our ancestors were not seeking reparations. Yeah, from the moment that Africans were forced to board these ships to come across the ocean, they resisted enslavement. I mean, we get kind of incense when people say, oh, you know, we're just a country of immigrants. Um, it's like, well, actually that's not true. Uh, you know, there were native peoples here uh, before white people, you know, forced uh, Africans to come. Uh, and even when you talk about immigrants, um, some of us were, uh, came here voluntarily and others of us were forced in shackles to come. So that's a narrative that we would like to see die away. All right. And so I have a quick question get in. about um, how, how did you come up with the 12 year marker for people to have identified? So, uh, so the, the, the premise here is, and, and it's somewhat arbitrary, but the premise here is that we wanted people to self-identify as Black, Negro, or African American before they would have any awareness that there was a financial advantage to doing so. So uh, originally we said 10 years, I think, uh, but then once the reparations, uh, the intensity of the reparations debate began, uh, to really to really steam up in 2018 and 2019, we said, well, you know, there may be some people out there now who are going to call themselves black just so they can get on 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 the reparations uh, on the reparations payment system. So we added two more years because that's two senatorial two terms. terms. Yeah, uh, is 12 okay. years. Yeah, yeah. I want to bring in one of the other members of our reading group, um, Deborah Snow is the uh, owner of the Blue Heron Restaurant uh, here in uh, Western Mass. She's a longtime political activist, um, a photographer, and the former owner of Persephone Press, a lesbian publishing house. Uh, most recently, she launched uh, Bridge for Unity as an interracial dialogue uh, and cultural exchange uh, project, uh, building anti-racism. And um, she was a part of the reading group, and. Uh, has a question for us. Deborah? Oh, hi, and uh, happy Juneteenth. I'm, I'm, uh, what, how exciting to have you here. And, uh, but first, I want to thank Dr. Shabazz and D. Shabazz and the uh, Amherst Media Project for putting this together. Uh, this is such an important, uh, not just topic, but an important action that needs to be taken. Uh, in these United States, and and your work, your book is powerful and co and compelling to help us move forward. So so thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you. So I have a couple questions. One is um, so there is a group in Cobra, and 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 certainly there's uh, I think what close to eighty percent support of of Black Americans who would support reparations. Uh, no, it's closer, to, it's closer to 65 yeah, it's not quite that it's high. Not that high. <laughs> well, we got to get it that high, but, but right. there are white Americans, but I, I know a lot of us want to work toward it. There's certainly uh, the um, uh, HR 40 uh, in Congress and in Senate. Uh, I forget what it is, but other than calling uh, your Congress people and your Senator to show support in those bills, how might white people connect? I mean, I certainly think we can do that, our part uh, in Bridge for Unity, but how might white people be moved to show their support? One of the things that we have been advocating uh, is for you know individuals to look at the formal and uh, informal uh, affiliations that they have and get all of these groups to make, uh, to petition and lobby Congress uh, for the passage of HR 40 and the enactment of a reparations program for Black American descendants of U.S. slavery. 
Um, so in our city, Durham, North Carolina, uh, our mayor, Steve Shule, has uh, proposed and the, and the city council has passed a resolution to this effect. Uh, they are going to lead the vanguard, uh, creating a coalition of cities, uh, but also inviting communities of faith, inviting colleges and universities, cultural institutions uh, to join them in this coalition to push for this initiative. Uh, the other thing that we are suggesting is that individuals get their own houses in order. You know, look at the, the organizations to which you belong um, and do an assessment. You know, um, who are the thought leaders that you consult? Um, if you are in positions to make hires, who's being hired? Uh, what do the salaries look across the racial line? Um, you know, there are a lot of things, I mean, you can add some things here too, that one might do. Um, you know, is the organization uh, only white people? Um, you know, when you are looking at who the vendors will be that you contact, um, who are they? You know, how are they selected? I mean, I think every day we make decisions that you know, put us closer or farther away from the society that we want. But we need to really put a magnifying glass on our own uh, communities and, and examine them, right? Um, yeah. No, no I, I, I don't have anything to add. I, I think that's right. We'd like to see people black and white actually form a coalition to lobby and petition Congress for a comprehensive national reparations program and uh, and as Kirsten said, you know, there's the question that we all have to face as to whether or not our own house is in order. You know, it's interesting. Um, some of you may have had a similar experience uh, that we had last fall uh, when we were, um, you know, we heard a number of our white friends and colleagues opine that they were not looking forward to going home for Thanksgiving. Uh, they were dreading conversations with an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a brother, even their own parents, who they feared or knew, uh, you know, had voted uh, for for Trump, and how you know they were just struggling, you know, with what will I say and how can I avoid a confrontation? I love my family, but I want to, you know, I don't want to to be in a protracted, ugly, toxic conversation, and. You know, I, 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 you know, offered what I could in the way of, you know, empathy and suggestions about, you know, other kinds of, you know, other ways to introduce new topics. But lately, I've been wondering, you know, did you, you know, did these individuals just suddenly discover that these family members and friends had these views? Yeah. Um, you know, when you were four years old and a relative used a racial epithet and your parents didn't clear the room, you know, yeah. Or you continue to visit and receive and give presents to these individuals. What was said? So I mean, I'm, and it's just interesting, you know, that uh, Trump's election became a touch point, I guess, for a lot of whites. Um, it's like, well, you know, things were bad, but not that bad, mm. you know. Uh, but suddenly, you know, for some, it was time to talk about it. I mean, maybe this is something that you all could enlighten us about because we certainly would like to hear more, to learn more about this. And if I just have a question to add. So communities here, Steve Shul would be, we could contact him or, uh, Absolutely. and he'd be helpful in yes. moving yeah, our yeah, community yeah. along. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes, we'd be very happy to put you in touch with Steve. Yeah, we'd make the connection, that'd be great. Yeah. I would like to uh, bring in Alan Davis, an educator, racial justice advocate, and creator of a historical timeline of reparations paid by the United States to Blacks, Indigenous people, and Japanese Americans from 1783 to 2020. Um, I got to <laughs> get to know Alan back in 2018 when he established the James Baldwin Lecture at the uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, we were part of hosting uh, the, uh, the keynote speaker, the lecturer for that occasion, and um, over at New Africa House. And uh, I just would um, bring Alan in, to, uh, who's part of the reading group, to uh, uh, talk about uh, 
his uh, questions of, uh, of you all and of the book. Dr. Schwaz, thanks very much for your kind words. And uh, it's an honor to be here with everybody today, especially uh, Sandy and, and Kirsten. Um, so what got me uh, really inspired about reparations, it doesn't go back to 1989 like it does with you, Sandy, but it was Ta-Nehisi Coates' article in 2014 about the case for reparations in the, the Atlantic. Um, and that got me uh, really to do some research and hence cr create the uh, time timeline. And I've got a two-part question for you, which gets to your the last chapter in your superb book, um, at chapter 13, A Program for Black Reparations. So the first part of the question is, what are the key elements of reparations legislation that you would like to see go to the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate? Oh, okay, so the, the, the first element, and uh, you know, maybe the list is longer, but I'll, I'll try to identify what I think are some of the priorities and uh, consistent with what we've tried to say in the book. So one of the first uh, components of, of uh, legislation for reparations must be identification of whom are the eligible recipients. And so as we've said, uh, we have two criteria in mind. The first is an individual must be a descendant of somebody who was enslaved in the United States. And second, the individual must have self-identified as being Black, Negro, or African American for at least 12 years before the enactment of the reparations program or a study commission, whichever comes first. Uh, so that's the, the first thing that has to be clearly established is the eligibility. Uh, there also needs to be a, uh, a, a clear statement of what the mission of the reparations project should be. And in the work that we've done, we've argued that the highest priority for a reparations program is elimination of the racial wealth gap. So uh, as, as, as you, you probably know from our previous conversation, Black Americans are about 13% of the, the country's population, but only possess 2.6% of the nation's wealth. And correspondingly, that means that the average Black household has $800,000 less in net worth than the average white household. So that's the gap that we think should be closed by a reparations program. And we think that uh, that's got to be a central component of any reparations program. Uh, there are some other things that, that I think Kirsten would add. Um, the, did you, you mention the time frame? No, no, I didn't. So the HR 40 as written, um, marks the start date for the reparations uh, account at 1619. But since for our purposes, the culpable party is the federal government and the, the Republic didn't exist until 1776, that date would need to be changed, right? Um, the question of who makes the selection of the commission members, um, HR 40 uh, currently says that the president uh, and some members of, uh, and the president and yeah, the president can appoint three, three of the 13. Of the 13. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd like to visualize who Donald Trump would appoint to a. Yeah. Uh, I well, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, certainly it's likely that this, the, the Congress with the, the current composition is not going to support this. Uh, so that's a, a main thing is for us to you know, be about the business of changing the composition of the Congress. But we, for us, you know, since this is a congressional commission, we would like to see Congress make those appointments and not the president. Um, and then uh, the education component we think is really important. Uh, I spent a lot of time looking at six different commissions around the world uh, that have uh, had as their mission reparations variously defined. You know, I looked at um, victims of the, the Holocaust. I looked at uh, Japanese Americans who were unlawfully interned in the United States uh, during World War II. Um, looked at the Kerner Commission, which uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson um, uh, set up while the Detroit riot was still taking place. Um, looked at um, 
the 9-11 Commission, uh, 9-11 Victims Fund. These are the folks who were, um, you know, uh, who were killed and injured uh, during that terrorist attack. Looked at Sandy Hook, uh, uh, Connecticut. It's a horrible you know, shooting of the grade school kids and six administrators. And, um, you know, the education component for the Japanese American um, Commission was gutted 80% uh, Bill, under Bill Clinton's administration. Um, you know, there was incredible uh, array of um, plans for curriculum in the schools, public service announcements, the commission of plays, of, of uh, dances, um, poetry, um, just an amazing, uh, you know, an amazing uh, program that would have brought to life, you know, the lives of Japanese Americans in the U.S. and what had happened to them. Uh, but because the funds for the education program were so, you know, were decimated, most people don't even know that it happened. Uh, they don't know that Japanese Americans were interned, and they don't know that the United States paid reparations. So we would like to see um, at least three generations of uh, Americans being taught about, first of all, our history, period, American history. You know, people always want to say, oh, you talk about black history. This is American history. We, we've all created this country together. Um, but we're, you know, our hope is that if every grade level and colleges too, for three generations are taught a more accurate, uh, you know, taught more accurate story, and hopefully we won't, you know, repeat ourselves or find ourselves, um, you know, uh, in a situation where we don't remember, don't know mm -hmm. what actually happened. We, we use the, the term dismemory in the text as uh, a representation of the way in which uh, a false history has been imposed upon the American public at large, particularly with respect to the historical record concerning the Civil War and the Reconstruction Era. And so uh, that's, that's, that's one of the things that we're, we think is absolutely critical, that we need to have a truthful history of the United States that is uh, shared widely. We also uh, use the term deconfederatization mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we're absolutely convinced that one of the central problems in America today is the fact that we still treat the Confederacy as if it was a heroic project rather than the act of traitorship, which it was. And so uh, as a consequence, while Germany engaged in denazification with greater or lesser success, that has never been done in the United States with respect to the presence of the Confederacy or lost cause ideology. I was reading an article today um, that uh, gives about the 10 US military bases that are named for Confederate uh, officers. And I was just, I, I knew of, of, of two, but I had no idea there were 10 of them. Right. Um, it's like, how is this even possible? Um, you know, or that American soldiers uh, would hoist the Confederate flag uh, in Vietnam, in Iraq, in um, Grenada, you know, it, wherever they went, they took that flag with them. Um, this is an abomination. It should not have been allowed to happen. The area you're discussing now kind of anticipates, I know, a question on the mind of uh, our next reading group member, but let me introduce Paula Green who founded and uh, formally directed the Karuna Center for Peace Building. She's also Professor Emerita at the School for International Training and currently serves as a mentor and consultant both at home and abroad and is engaged in facilitating dialogues across divides with polarized communities in the U.S. She's been um, a vital figure within our uh, Bridge for Unity uh, helping to train kind of all of us in many of the techniques of intergroup dialogue. And so I invite uh, Paula to, uh, to this conversation. Thank you, Shabazz, and thank you so much to our authors. I read the book quickly, end to end. I loved every, every chapter in that book. Um, it was very informative to me. And as a psychologist by training, this concept of dismemory interests me greatly. It's um, not remembering is a defense mechanism. It's a defense mechanism against reality. We don't want to remember. 
And we're, of course, we have to remember. So the question that I have for you is, what do you imagine that arms of government and other kinds of institutions could do with a project of dismembering, of recapitulating memory for people so that it comes out as the truth and not on the distortions that we've all learned in our history books. And because it's hard to break through denial, it's a very serious project to take on dismembering. And I'm wondering how you think about it. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. Um, you know, I think about the textbooks that I was exposed to in grade school and even in college in American history classes. And um, I mean, the first thing that you would notice is, you know, in a book this thick, there might be four pages, you know, on the Negro. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I remember thinking, wow, you know, you know, I mean, your emotions were everything from, is that all that we did? To why isn't there more, right? Uh, but who do, who do you take those questions to, right? No. Um, so, you know, there, there, there definitely should be, I think, uh, books written at every level, um, at, you know, textbooks, but also, um, you know, paperbacks. Uh, there, there are a number of uh, series that focus, uh, you know, as um, 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 it's, you know, this gentleman has, has, has spoken to us about uh, the importance of having personal stories, individual stories. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that has been something that has really compelled people when we have been talking about these ills, the harms, the atrocities. Much of what we uh, wrote, uh, much of what we learned was new to us. Um, I mean, just take, for example, in my case, um, uh, the slave rebellions. I knew of three such events. I knew about Nat Turner. I knew about VC. I knew a little bit about Cinque, but that was from the movies, you know. And then when we began to do this research, we discovered hundreds of such uprisings. Um, you know, Professor Shabazz uh, uh, reference the cover of our book, From Here to Equality, which has uh, a photograph uh, from the Peace and Justice Memorial um, in um, Montgomery. And, you know, hanging from the ceiling are uh, these memorials uh, by county, and they, they indicate the names and the dates of the individuals who were lynched. And, um, and so we, we were walking through, some of them may have one or two or five or seven. And so after a while we thought, wait a minute, you know, let's make a list of each one that has maybe five or more people. And particularly when uh, the dates that they were lynched are close together. Mm -hmm. And we thought, wait a minute, was that a massacre? You know, was that an uprising? Mm -hmm. And so then we would go to archival materials and you might discover that in fact, you know, eight you know black people by name frequently were listed who were executed publicly you know for having attempted an uprising it's like oh okay this is interesting um often though uh as in the case with wilmington north carolina i believe the uh, and and this is also the case uh, for the memorial um for elaine arkansas there may be a list say of 12 or 15 people by name and then it will say and 200 others or and 300 others right so yeah and that, that was no uprising on the part of black folks that, right in either case that was white mob terror violence <laughs> right. yeah, yeah you all know the story of wilmington north carolina this is an 1898 coup ah so Sandy, maybe start do we have time to talk about that yes good okay. excellent okay. excellent so um in 1898, uh, in the state of North Carolina, the city of Wilmington, which is a coastal city, was the largest city, it was the most prosperous city, and it had a, a significant black community. I think the majority of the city was a black, uh, was a black community that was comparatively prosperous at the time. Um, and um, and it, was, it became increasingly evident that the uh, white officialdom, not just in the city itself, but across the state, uh, the whites who were associated with the, uh, with the white supremacy movement uh, were, com were, uh, 
we're determined to do something about that. Uh, it's, it's interesting that towards the end of the 1890s, the state of North Carolina had what was referred to as a fusion government, which was an alliance between uh, the Republican Party, which was heavily, uh, heavily influenced by the formerly enslaved Blacks, and uh, the Populist Party, which was a party that consisted of white farmers for the most part. And they actually had the governorship of the state and had a significant number of the legislative offices. But in the case of Wilmington, they were in complete control of the local government. And so uh, under the pretext of uh, some sort of inflammatory editorial that was written in the local black newspaper, uh, there was an explosion of rage on the part of whites. They uh, forced all of the elected officials out of office. Uh, they killed a massive number of individuals who were black in the city. Uh, they destroyed or appropriated black property. And uh, by the time we look at the characteristics of the city in another 10 years, you have a minority black population and you have a city that's in complete control of white supremacists. There's a fascinating documentary film called Wilmington on Fire. Um, Christopher Everett Christopher, is Christopher the Everett. writer and director of that film um, that has a tremendous amount of information about it uh, and also the commission that was created in North Carolina to investigate uh, what happened, but no reparations have been paid uh, to any of those individuals. And, and, and they have a, you know, a lot of data about you know the houses, the, the newspaper Dang. that was destroyed. Um. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to uh, to add something very brief to Paula's uh, to Paula's question. I can't hear. Which? I'm sorry. You're saying you can't hear. Oh, can there, nobody hear us? Or? And we're oh. hearing you. We hear you. Oh, okay. Oh, he, he, but he can't hear us. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to do about that because I don't think we have any control over it on our end. You can go out and come back in if you if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. We also hear Sandy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Ari doesn't hear me though. Yeah. We hear you. Okay. okay. Well, I I I wanted to say that there are a specific set of lies that have been told. Yes, indeed. That need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, you know, what's the best way to do that, uh, but it would be great if those lies were not taught in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, so the reconstruction of curriculum is, is vital. But some of these lies include the claim that only 2% of all Americans and all Southern Americans own slaves. I mean, I've actually heard that statistic offered. Uh, and, and I've also heard uh, you know, some of the lost cause types say that the majority of slave owners were black. Okay. Uh, another thing that they frequently say is, well, reparations has already been paid because of the sacrifice of 600,000 uh, American lives during the course of the Civil War. Well, you know, half of those deaths were from folks who were fighting to preserve slavery. And uh, a disproportionate number of the deaths that took place on the, in the Union Army were the deaths of black soldiers. So what you do when you introduce that $600,000, a 600,000 person figure is you erase the contributions of blacks to their own liberation from slavery in the United States. And so, uh, so, so I, I would say that one of the things that, that has to be done is to uh, actually, in a detailed way, confront what are outright lies about American history. That's what dismemory does. It's what it's supposed to do. And we, we live in a media world, so this, these are media jobs, even more than yes. textbooks jobs, because media reaches so many more people so much more quickly and efficiently. I'd like to say about in, in, in the view that I might have missed something, I'm going to add to Professor Darity's uh, sharing about their yeah, focus on the uh, federal government. But you know, federal, uh, Professor Darity, there's more than the federal government. There was the churches, there was the financial institutions, there was the colleges and universities. Right. Those, that's the four pillars of uh, enslavers that uh, set up that institution called chattel slavery. In fact, 
most of the plantation owners morphed into uh, trustees of these colleges and universities. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, in in um, in what is it in chapter two of the book? Yes. No, uh, chapter three. three. Chapter three. We talk. Uh, the chapter is actually called uh, "Who Who, who Benefited from Who Benefited from the Fruits of Slavery." Yeah. And there's an extended discussion of colleges and universities. There's some discussion of churches and the like. The difficulty is, and this is the complication, and this is the complication that people have run into when they've tried to bring court cases against institutions that had complicity with slavery. The problem is slavery was legal. Was legal. And so the institution that created the legal and authority environment for slavery is the federal government. And so as a consequence, the federal government, from our perspective, is who has to pay the bill. But many Sandy, have if tried, I, many, have tried, I was like, many have tried to bring these lawsuits, but they have not been successful. Not a single one. Not a single one of them. Well, the key reason why we haven't been I'm successful. Like, like, this is not at odds for on a voluntary basis if institutions oh, are absolutely absolutely, not. absolutely. Right. any act of atonement that any individual or any institution right. wants to make is fine but they don't call it reparations and and here's the other key yeah. thing so we've said that the objective of a reparations program must be elimination of the racial wealth gap the only institution in the united states that has the capacity to do that is the federal government so for example if you took all of the state budgets combined that would amount to about $2 trillion. But the minimum requirement for erasure of the racial wealth gap in the United States is at least $10 trillion. And the only institution that has that capability is the federal government. But again, the federal government is the institution that made slavery something legal. It made Jim Crow legal. It ignored the white massacres that took place. It is complicit with the existence of mass incarceration, police executions of unarmed blacks, the persistence of discrimination in employment, credit and housing markets. All of those things are the responsibility of the federal government. It's federal policies that created the racial wealth gap. And so we must have federal policy to reverse the racial wealth gap. Well, I think many of the universities disagree with you, Professor Darity, because they have, have uh, apologized for their role in enslavement. Harvard, Georgetown University, George Washington University. And so we just cannot leave it to the federal government because it will end up being another, another welfare program, right? So No, 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 I reject that altogether. It's not a welfare program. It's, it's merit pay for American injustice. My last point is... It's not a welfare program. In fact, in fact the most significant handout that has ever been delivered to anyone is the 160-acre partitions of land that was formerly under the possession of, of Native Americans under the Homestead Act. And today, the low end estimate indicates that there are 45 million white Americans who are beneficiaries of the Homestead Act allocations. That's a handout. That's a real handout. But my point I was driving to, Professor Therapy, is that Reparations can, the federal government, colleges and universities, financial institutions, and the church cannot dictate what uh, programs of reparation look like. That must come from the people who were injured. You know, if they do so, it's just like precisely why, which is precisely why the payout should go to the individuals themselves. Let me finish. They would have the not, I'm, I'm, I'm moving on from that. I'm saying that to to allow uh, <clears throat> to allow the uh, federal government. So colleges and universities, financial institutions, and churches dictate what the reparations look like. It's, it's just like allowing the criminal to be judge and jury and decide what sentence they will get. It doesn't change the relationship. Can you see that? It doesn't change the relationship. No, I, you know? I, I don't see that. But the, the relationship is still remains between the enslaved and the slavers. I, I don't see that. Be broken. And, I don't see that in the context of our proposal. Full repair. I think that just I, not just financial, it must be full repair. What I'm called, the monstrous destruction of, uh, of our life and our culture and all the human possibilities. I, I think you're talking about somebody else's plan for reparations besides no, ours. Well, exactly, because I disagree with yours. I have to talk about it if I disagree with it. But you what, what, you're dis off. what you're disagreeing <laughs> with is not consistent with what, what we're said. proposing. Yeah. We say, 
It is. If you're saying that the federal government is, is, is the arbiter of what reparations no, look like. No, no you said the federal pay government pay must pay the, pay the bill. They we pay the bill. The federal government should dictate what people do with it. The payouts go or to how individual it, eligible recipients. You're only talking who about full check. discretion over check. what to do with it. The payout got to be more than a check. We're talking about full repair, not just a check. You see, reparations about total development from your single person for your for and for your peoplehood that was destroyed. Yes, Riley, we'll it's, have to give you a show. We'll have to give you a that's show. That's right. I appreciate that. Let me say one thing. Let me say one thing. Thank you so very much. Let me say one thing here. If individuals received a substantial endowment from the federal government as compensation for America's racial history, then they could make the decision to purchase psychological care if they so desired. Others may not want to do that. They could make the decision to migrate to the African continent and live in an African country with the funds that they receive if they so desire. So it would be a matter of individual discretion about what is done with the funds. And we think that that's a non-paternalistic approach and we think it's an appropriate approach, but it is not a situation in which the federal government will be telling people what to do with the money. And Sandy, if I'm correct, the, the kind of, uh, some of the research that has tried to get at a figure, um, I know they, they're different studies and it, it ranges, but are we talking in about the for for a qualifying household something in the ballpark of a hundred to two hundred thousand no for a household it would be eight hundred thousand dollars eight hundred thousand okay it would be eight hundred thousand dollars per household per individual somewhere between two hundred and two hundred fifty thousand dollars so i i have a, i have a, a something that the amherst media feed is about to go back to their regular programming like i said i think we will have to do this uh um uh, give a, a, a particular program for some of our uh, our guests to talk about uh, 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 ideas as well. But we do want to thank uh, Professor uh, Darity and uh, um, uh, Professor Mullen for joining us on this conversation. Um, this is exactly what we hope will will the book is generative of um, uh, intense thought, vigorous debate. And, um, and hopefully moving toward actual policy and action. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to count out, but uh, Jeff, if you um, are still there, you were prompting me from the other direction. We do just want to say thank you so much for allowing us to come and, and talk with you about our work and this, this really important movement that um, will transform the, the nation. Uh, if we if we push to make it happen and we need all of your voices uh, to be a part of that and we thank you so much for engaging with us today thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you thank you thank you thanks so much thank you wonderful for us yes